From its inception in April 1986, the Karate Mania show had been one of the biggest recurring events in professional martial arts, as well as the premier showcase for above-the-waist kickboxing. A lot had changed in the field of full-contact karate by the time the eighth installment took place, but in many ways, the show remained a reassuring mainstay of classic competition. Karate Mania 8 was held on March 26, 1994 at the Verdun Auditorium in Montreal, the site of at least one previous Karate Mania show. It was promoted as a PKA event, but since the Professional Karate Association hadn't had the power to sanction matches since the mid-80s, the show was actually regulated by the Professional Karate Commission or PKC. The production was aired for pay-per-view on the Showtime Network, a regular partner for both organizations, and featured an unconventionally small card of only three matches. However, these were all major world title fights, featuring several of karate's biggest stars of the past decade. The theme of the night seemed to be the battle of generations, with most of the matches featuring a significant age difference between competitors. Let's examine these battles and see if they lived up to the Karate Mania name. We open with nothing less than a title versus title match to crown an undisputed champion. It's the PKC World Lightweight Champ Paul Vizio versus the Kick Lightweight Titleist Juan Torres, both boxers putting their belts on the line. Like all matches of the night, this will be 12 rounds of 2 minutes each. A 3 knockdown rule will be in effect and there will be no standing 8 count. Additionally, the fighters will be obliged to throw a minimum of 8 kicks per round. The 25-year-old Torres is a full 17 years younger than his opponent, and had idolized Vizio in his youth. The man nicknamed the Ghost Warrior enters with a record of 28, 2-1 with 15 knockouts, and he also reigns as the WKA World Lightweight Champion. He'd previously captured the FFKA Lightweight title in 1988, only two years after turning pro, and now is vying not only for his opponent's belt but for the reputation of being the absolute best in his weight class. His adversary may very well be the ultimate unsung hero of American kickboxing, his accolades every bit as impressive as fellow superstars Denis Alexio and Jean-Yves Theriot. Vizio is a somewhat secretive kung fu stylist from New England whose record speaks for itself, 39 wins and 1 loss with 27 knockouts. He's fought professionally since the 1970s and won his first world title in 1981, at which point he'd already earned his reputation for flashiness and tremendous defensive technique. However, the background of the match is that Vizio hasn't been very active since his heyday. There's some contention between the commentators whether he's had five matches in the last two years or two matches in the last five, but either way, the champion is potentially out of practice as he faces one of the strongest challenges of his career, and Vizio will need to channel his greater experience to counter Juan's strength and age advantage. Round 1. The fighters feel each other out with quick and crafty kicks. Torres seems to catch Vizio on the cheek with an inside roundhouse but the American is unperturbed. Torres sinks a sidekick. Vizio avoids an overhand and throws a flashy inside heel kick, then avoids a flurry of strikes. Torres avoids a reverse spinning roundhouse and counters with a high side kick. The action stops briefly when Vizio attempts a sweep that turned into a low kick, but the fighters are back within moments, Torres blocking a front kick and Vizio avoiding a mid kick and then a heel kick. Round 2. Torres stifles a side kick from Vizio with one of his own, then lands a more decisive kick, moments later. Vizio puts his defensive skills to good work by slipping out of the way of Torres's subsequent kicks, before darting in with strikes of his own. He lands a couple body blows, absorbs a snapping roundhouse kick to the neck, then hits a countering jab with his back to the ropes. Round 3. Dueling kicks start things off, but eventually the fighters put their boxing to work with powerful combinations. Excellent defense by both men keeps most strikes from landing during the first minute, 
after which Torres manages to sink another sidekick in a spinning back kick. They trade round kicks to the body, and Vizio celebrates prematurely after Torres slips on the canvas. With a quarter of the match now over, the story so far has been of Torres as the aggressor while Paul Vizio makes himself a moving target. The quality of competition is excellent, with both fighters getting to show off while playing to their strengths, but neither has gained a real advantage. Round 4. Vizio gets the better of a punching exchange before throwing two lightning fast kicks on a single extension. He forces Torres against the ropes but opts to back off, and throws another double kick. He lands a stiff countering jab and skillfully avoids his opponent's attempts at retaliation. More excellent defensive prowess from the PKC champ follows, but in the final seconds, Torres lands a side kick to Vizio's kidney and avoids a reverse spinning heel kick. Round 5. Torres begins the round looking a little tired but shows no shortage of energy when powering forward. Vizio responds with some flashy kicks to open the distance, then repeatedly feints when the fighters meet in the center. Torres partially lands a side kick, then manages to sink a hook before Vizio can dart away. Round 6 begins with an inadvertent low blow. Torres sinks a left jab at medium range, then another up close. Vizio hits Torres with a straight left to the jaw but Juan promptly comes back with a right hook. A spinning jump kick precedes a left hook from Torres, and he connects with a high side kick. Vizio very nearly lands an axe kick, then hits a right overhand. With the match halfway through its allotted runtime, we've seen an exciting contrast of styles and strategies. Juan Torres has largely chosen to stick with the basics as he attempts to brawl with his opponent, while Paul Vizio has been content to fight from the outside while seemingly throwing every technique in his arsenal. We still haven't seen either of them carve out a clear advantage, and if the rest of the match plays out in similar fashion, victory may be determined by which strategy is more impressive to the judges. Round 7. Vizio opens with an axe kick followed by a left mid-kick. The boxers exchange punches at the center, after which Vizio keeps the distance with even more kicks. Torres throws a spinning back kick that doesn't connect properly. Vizio is unbalanced during an exchange but still avoids a right straight. A hard exchange seems to favor Vizio, after which he counters an overhand with a front kick. Torres misses with an overhand and back kick combo, then the fighters block simultaneous round kicks. Some strikes to the torso momentarily knock Torres off balance, and Vizio avoids a big roundhouse before the bell. Round 8. Vizio feints repeatedly before throwing back to back heel kicks. A body blow is traded for a front kick, then another. Torres indicates that a side kick from Vizio connected with his thigh, but Paul's follow-up back kick connects clearly with the midsection. Torres sinks one of his own, and Vizio lands a solid mid-kick. Torres slips while delivering a kick of his own but avoids a countering straight in the process. Round 9. Torres begins with a bloodied nose, and for the first time takes a defensive position against his seemingly more energized opponent. Vizio snaps a kick against Torres's head, then lands a hard left jab. Torres then must absorb a front kick to the dome and a round kick to the torso. Vizio ducks under Juan's own attack and turns him around, but gets partially caught by a spinning back fist. He takes a more decisive right hook to the cheek but can stonewall a spinning back kick. Round 10. A jumping front kick by Vizio is followed by a more effective spinning back variant. A close exchange ends with a back kick from Torres, blocked by his opponent. Vizio sinks a mid kick and Torres lands a back kick, then barely misses with a left hook when the fighters break from a clinch. Vizio accepts an apologetic gesture but promptly puts Torres on the defensive with a lightning combo. Then, a fateful sidekick from Torres strikes Vizio on the inner thigh as Paul jumps in with a roundhouse, and controversially, the referee deducts a point from the Ghost Warrior. 
Immediately feeling the pressure this placed him under, a frustrated Torres lays in hard but can't land much of substance before the bell. Round 11. Clearly fired up, Torres catches Vizio by surprise with a hook and snap kick, then ducks out of the way of a sidekick. Juan squarely lands a sidekick of his own to the face, then repeatedly pushes Vizio towards the corners. Both boxers miss spinning backfists but Torres sinks a left jab from a distance. He barely misses with a spinning heel kick, then seems to partially connect with a back kick to the chest. Vizio comes in with effective punches but Torres sinks a retaliatory back kick before the bell rings. With only one round to go, this fight doesn't seem as though it can get any closer. Both participants are still competing with a high level of energy, and despite Torres being set back by the penalty, either fighter remains within striking distance of victory. A knockout isn't out of the question. Final round. The fighters alternatively block and avoid each other's major strikes, including a reverse and front roundhouse exchange. Vizio turns into a left round kick, he sinks a right hook to the chin while against the ropes, but Torres is able to reply with a left jab. The fighters repeatedly evade as the clock ticks down, with Torres eventually landing a roundhouse kick to the jaw but throwing himself off balance with a missed overhand. A big left hook lands on Vizio's chin, and another connects at close range shortly before the bell. The fight is over. The boxers have gone the distance, and in doing so, they may have already stolen the show. It's difficult to imagine a more exciting match, this fight instantly rebuking anyone who doubts how thrilling above the waist competition can be. The judge's decision finally arrives, and a unanimous verdict is announced for Paul Vizio, who becomes the unified lightweight champion. Two of the three officials awarded him the match by the smallest of margins, indicating that the controversial penalty in round 10 definitely helped decide the winner. While the contentious call is disappointing, it doesn't take away from what was a truly spectacular match. Say what you want about the outcome, but Paul Vizio proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that, even at age 42, he was every bit as effective and entertaining as in his prime. As it turned out, this was actually the beginning of a comeback, as Vizio competed with regularity until at least 2002. He eventually retired with a record of 47-1, and, and now teaches the martial arts in New Jersey. I'm not sure when exactly Juan Torres retired, but it happened around the turn of the century as the result of a stroke. Regardless, he'd already managed to fully carve out his legacy as one of the best in the business. His loss to Vizio was to be the last he suffered during his kickboxing career, as he retired with a record of 50-3 with a single no contest. He was a six-time world champion. He also enjoyed a smaller career as a pro boxer, in which capacity he earned significant victories over several national and regional titleists. As of 2011, he works as a security advisor in Las Vegas. It's time for the big guys to do battle, as Denis Alexio defends his PKC World Heavyweight title against number 4 ranked challenger Dick Kimber. This match is sort of the exception to the night's intergenerational theme, as it's not age that separates the fighters as much as experience. Kimber, 32 years old, boasts a 17-1 record, while Alexio, 34, is presented as 56-1 with a single no contest. Dick is a security officer at the notoriously dangerous Essex County Correctional Facility in Massachusetts, a fact which is hyped up by the pre-match promotional package. He'd been kickboxing since at least 1981 and enters as the FIBK World Cruiserweight Champion. All but one of his victories have come by way of knockout, and if hoopla and determination were enough to win matches, then the destroyer would be guaranteed a victory tonight. But of course, he finds himself in the ring with one of the single most dominant competitors in all of full contact karate. I've talked at length about Alexio's status as a living legend in previous videos and will try not to repeat myself, but at this point in his career, 
Dennis is trying to rebuild his reputation following the controversial match with Stan Longinidis. He's fully recovered from his related injury and delivered a particularly mighty performance at the previous Karate Mania in January, and he seems to be leaning into his strengths as a purely above-the-waist fighter. This goes against the tide of worldwide kickboxing trends, but it helps maintain his superstar status in North America. He's held the title for two and a half years, and taking it from him is sure to be a tall order for any opponent. Round 1. The fighters begin by trading kicks, Kimber almost immediately taking the defensive and trying to control the distance. He takes a left jab to the face and repeatedly finds himself against the ropes, his own strikes doing little damage to Alexio. He finally makes the Terminator back off with some punches to the head, but Dennis comes back with strikes to the body and face. Kimber's kicked and punched into the corner, where he absorbs punches to the face and kicks to the body. An attempted comeback yields little success for the challenger, as his tendency to punch from the shoulder limits the power he can generate. The fight's definitely begun in Dennis's favor, the Terminator showing off both his strength and durability in the first two minutes. The second round is preceded by a bizarre exchange wherein the referee demands the removal of Alexio's grass skirt. This only seems to irritate the fighter, who promptly lays into his opponent with big hooks and roundhouse kicks against the ropes. Kimber surprises the champion with a couple of retaliatory overhands but kills his own momentum with a clinch. Alexio returns with a series of massive strikes against the ropes, culminating with a huge roundhouse kick that leads to the first knockdown of the night. Kimber rises, but he's quickly knocked into the corner with a spinning back kick. Alexio leaps into the frame with a flying kick, but it's his round kick to the midsection that sends Kimber back down. With his nose bloodied, Dick looks like he wants to continue fighting but can't muster the strength for a second time. He's counted out and Dennis Alexio wins the match by knockout, retaining his championship and delivering the most dominant performance of the night. It's the 52nd knockout of his career. In defense of Dick Kimber, the destroyer apparently suffered broken ribs during the match, resulting in his not being able to fight for as long or as hard as he might have otherwise. Regardless, the outcome seems to be exactly what the crowd wants, and Alexio basks in his solidified status as champion. It's another victory for the established star, another point for nostalgia, and Dennis would continue in much the same fashion until his retirement in 1999. Kimber's career continued until the year 2000. He eventually became a three-time world champion, and his record stood at 23-3 following his match against Don Wilson in 1999. In 2022, he was inducted into the Action Martial Arts Magazine Hall of Honors. We've reached the top of the marquee, the match which doubtlessly drew more fans to the auditorium than either of the others. It's one of the quintessential showdowns in kickboxing history, Jean-Yves Terrio vs. Rick Rufus, for the PKC World Light Heavyweight Championship. According to PKA President Joe Corley, this match has been eight years in the making, but my impression is that the build-up goes all the way back to December 1984, when Terrio met fellow icon Don Wilson for their original Great North American Showdown. The Wilson bout constituted a turning point in the Canadian's career. When a controversial decision draw denied him recognition as the absolute best in the sport, it gave fodder to those who criticized the Iceman's typical level of competition, and Terrio was compelled to fight more opponents who were universally considered among the best. This resulted in some of the more memorable matches of his career, but it also exposed him to rare losses, in the form of a controversial TKO to Dutch superstar Rob Common and an even more controversial split decision loss to Australian boxer Tosca Petridis. It's difficult to gauge Terrio's mindset at this point in his career. He's one of the longest reigning world champions of all time, and at age 39, it's possible he doesn't think he has anything left to prove. But with the sport evolving around him and retirement pending, the Iceman has to be considering his reputation. 
There may have been contention whether he's actually the best in the world, but he could at least take pride in being the very best in the Americas. That is, until Rick Rufus called this status into question. Rufus is part of the new generation in kickboxing that includes the aforementioned Rob Common and Stan Longinidis, and he deserves a lot of the credit for upping the level of competition in above the waist fighting. Fast, flashy, and with knockout power in both fists and feet, he was apparently considered a worthy opponent for Terry O even before he became a world champion, but his reputation has skyrocketed since their fight was originally proposed. Virtually untouchable under his favored American rules, Rufus nevertheless earned recognition and respect across the world through an iconic showdown with Thai boxer Chongpuk Kiat Songrit. While it would be years before the Jet fully embraced low-kick rules, he's already fully embraced international competition and boasts impressive victories over rising Dutch stars like Common, Leo de Snow and Ernesto Host. It's impossible to understate his status, Rick having earned the sort of reputation where it would be a shock for him to suffer even a single loss. However, as long as Terrio remains active, it's impossible for Rufus to call himself the undisputed best in America. Rick recognizes this, and thus has been eagerly pursuing Jean Yves. Their showdown may very well be the most hotly anticipated match in American kickboxing, and the buildup has certainly been dramatic. It was highlighted by Rufus fully embracing the persona of a brash young champion. He aggressively called out his opponent earlier in the year, flung crushed ice at him during a press event, and has predicted a first-round knockout. The audience is electrified as the fighters make their entrances. Terrio, the challenger, boasts a record of 68, 5 and 1 with 60 knockouts, and reigns as the PKC and ISKA World Super Middleweight Champion. Rufus, the PKC World Light Heavyweight Champion, is 44 and 1 with 26 knockouts under American rules, and also reigns as the ISKA and IKF World Light Heavyweight title holder. Both fighters are fixtures of not only the PKC, but of the Karate Mania series in particular having fought in the very first event back in 1986. Rufus has appeared in at least seven of the eight shows. As the two stare each other down, it's difficult to say who's the favorite to win, but it's easy to believe the hype that this will be one of the all-time greatest fights in history. Round 1. Terry O opens with an uncharacteristically opportunistic kick, and the fighters immediately struggle for the upper hand, with first Rufus and then Terry O against the ropes. Rufus lands some mid-kicks and drives the Iceman back with a combination. Terry O sinks a mid-kick of his own but Rufus comes back with a front kick. Round 2. Rufus slips after Terry O intercepts his roundhouse kick. Rufus lands a side kick but Terry O kicks away his roundhouse attempt. The Iceman breaches the Jets' defenses with a right straight but isn't accurate enough to actually connect. Rufus retaliates with a combination that makes Terry O back up against the ropes. He connects with a left straight, then with a spinning backhand that Terry O can't quite duck away from. Terry O then moves laterally to limit Rick's space and movement, but Rufus comes forward with another combo and utilizes effective head movement to avoid Terry O's own. Round 3. Terrio falls after Rufus appears to strike him close to the back of the head, and while Rick doesn't receive a warning, it isn't counted a knockdown. The Jet is immediately back on the attack, crowding the Canadian with relentless combinations. Terrio manages to block another spinning backfist, then pushes Rufus backwards with a front kick. A big spinning kick is countered, sending Rick off balance, but he hits a backfist. Dual straights land before the bell rings. The match is already a quarter of the way over, and so far seems to favor the faster and more accurate Rufus. Jean-Yves Terrio is holding his own but his textbook-style approach hasn't proven effective against his flashier opponent. Round 4. The round opens with the fighters exchanging kicks. Then, much like the Wilson fight from a decade ago, 
Terio finds what he's been looking for and abruptly takes advantage. As Rufus comes in, the Iceman lands a hard right hook that immediately has Rufus backing away. Clearly hurt, the Jet tries to put distance between them, but Terio gives chase and feints with a high right before socking him with a left hook that sends the champion to the canvas. It's officially the first time that Rick Rufus has suffered a knockdown during a full contact match, only the second time when counting the Chongpuk fight, and the auditorium erupts when it happens. Nevertheless, Rufus finds his feet quickly and manages to counter and evade for the remaining round, benefiting from the fact that Terio chooses not to pursue him aggressively. Rick Rufus managed to avoid potential catastrophe, but Terio has almost certainly won a lead in the judges' scorecards. We will see if he can capitalize. Round 5. Terio begins on the offensive but Rufus effectively counters with kicks, including a spinning back kick. A solid mid-kick makes Terio flinch and Rufus sends him against the ropes with a combination. Terio looks deceptively tired after absorbing several strikes but then comes in and connects with a straight to Rick's face. He catches Rick with a hard right against the ropes, unbalancing the jet, but Rufus manages to keep his feet until the bell. Round 6. An inadvertent low blow starts things off. Terio defends against Rufus' kicks, but still absorbs part of an axe kick. Rufus avoids a 1-2 combination in the corner, then causes Terio to flinch with a front kick. Terio corners Rufus against the ropes repeatedly but is either too slow or apprehensive to take advantage. Dual hooks land and Rufus follows up with a right straight. A punch very close to the back of the head sends Rick to the canvas again, but it's rightfully not ruled a knockdown. The match is halfway over, and while Terio definitely snatched the lead with his impressive knockdown, he's missed the opportunity to capitalize. Rick Rufus remains the more active fighter and continues to control the pace of the match, and while he's seen how effective the Iceman is at counter-striking, the knockdown hasn't depleted any of his energy. If anything, Terio is the one showing signs of slowing down, and this doesn't bode well for the older boxer. Both combatants are known for their stamina, but with the age difference weighed against him, it would behoove Jean-Yves to still try to finish the match as quickly as possible. Round 7. We open with a thrilling exchange as Rufus sinks a mid-kick, Terio returns with punches, and Rick pushes back with punches of his own. Terio's sent against the ropes with a punch-kick combo, and Rufus backs away from his retaliation. Rufus sinks a big left hand and uses his head movement to avoid the Iceman's comeback. Punches are exchanged at close range but nothing comes of it. Round 8. Terio lands a hard mid-kick but Rufus absorbs it. Rufus hits a countering straight, then throws a surprise left hook as he feints a walk-off. He partially connects with another left to the face, but an inside heel kick only glances off of the Iceman's back. He sinks some hooks at close range and does a masterful job of first maintaining distance and then evading as Terio comes in. Three quarters of the match completed sees Rick Rufus slowly making up the difference in points. Though he's long since been denied his prediction of a first-round knockout, the Jet seems to be winning a tactical battle against one of the sport's greatest technicians. The fight is once again too close to call but the pendulum is definitely swinging in Rufus's favor. Terio might be wondering if his strategy can still win the match, and no doubt the possibility of a repeat of the Don Wilson outcome has crossed his mind. There's no time left to make mistakes. Round 9. Terio blocks an opening backfist and continues to find himself on the defensive as Rufus stalks him around the ring. Rufus misses with another backfist and a second axe kick, but he's full of confidence as he showboats for the crowd. Terio keeps him at bay with a kick to the abdomen, and both fighters avoid each other's big hooks. Round 10. Terio partially connects with a right straight. The fighters juggle the role of aggressor, Terio eventually blocking a spinning back kick but taking a mid-kick against the ropes. 
A few jumping kicks from Rufus mix up what's largely been a conservative round, neither fighter feeling confident enough to take many chances. Round 11. The boxers throw kicks from a distance, but eventually the Canadian comes in to sink a mid-kick and hook. A jumping round kick from Rufus only makes contact with his opponent's hip, but a less risky mid-kick lands squarely, and he connects with a hard backfist in the closing seconds. We have reached the final two minutes of the match, and it's time for both Terrio and Rufus to call upon all the energy remaining in their bodies. Regardless of how the scorecards look, a strong final showing could seal the deal for either fighter. A knockout isn't beyond the realm of possibility. Round 12. Rufus lands a jumping kick to the torso and then another spinning backfist. Rufus stays on the offensive by punching Terrio into the corner. Terrio takes a strike at close range and doesn't come close to retaliating when Rufus drops his gloves. Sensing his opponent's weariness, Rick preemptively raises his arms before dancing inwards. Terrio manages to sink a short hook but it seems to barely do any damage. The last 10 seconds play out indecisively, Rufus seemingly riding out the clock until the final bell rings. The match has gone the distance, but it's over now and the decision must go to the judges. This isn't what either fighter wanted, but they've given the fans in attendance every possible second of exciting competition. A unanimous decision is announced for Rick Rufus, all judges having ruled in his favor by at least two points. The reaction from the crowd is delayed as the ring announcer delivers the verdict first in French, then English, but the eventual cheers are loud and enthusiastic for the retaining champion. Rick Rufus has established himself as arguably the single best fighter on the continent, and possibly in all of full contact karate. His ability to turn the match around from his fourth round setback is a testament to his toughness and ability to fight under pressure and it allowed his speed, agility and psychology to shine through and complete his work for him. Despite a post-match comment about wanting a rematch, posterity has revealed that this night in Montreal effectively marked the end of Jean-Yves Thériault's career, or at least influenced the inevitable decision. He stayed away from the ring for the rest of the year and for most of 1995, eventually announcing his retirement and fighting his final match in December. Perhaps he realized that the odds of regaining his crown were only growing longer with middle age. Or perhaps he wasn't interested in proving anything else. Whatever the case, he was able to retire as the ISKA World Light Heavyweight Champion two weeks before Christmas, his record standing at 69, 6-1. Rick Rufus had reached the zenith of his career. His reputation was the strongest it would ever be and his legacy as one of the greatest of all time was irrevocably established. However, his career wasn't even halfway over, as he competed around the world for another 18 years. He won at least two more world titles, as well as the first USA Grand Prix for the K-1 organization. He engaged in several more dream matches, the most significant of which included victories over fellow icons Stan Longinidis and Maurice Smith. Though he didn't go nearly as far as a heavyweight as he had in lower divisions, he retired in 2012 with a still imposing record of 65, 9 and 3. This may have been the last Karate Mania event ever produced, but even without this added emphasis, it's an excellent show. Despite the limited number of matches, its compactness serves to enhance the experience. There are no throwaway bouts and no unnecessary time killing. For the most part, this is genuinely the best competition that the sport had to offer, and it merits a complete watch. Full contact fans shouldn't go without, and even general martial arts fans would do well to investigate.